All right, thanks, Matt. And hello to everyone out there. I see a few familiar names. Um, I, uh, I'm i a dual career person, or at least I started with one career, got it to another. First career was in marketing, communications. And then in uh, the early 2000s, I switched to, uh, I'd gotten a degree in museum studies at Eastern and switched to the museum world where I've done a little bit of everything. Um, worked at big museums like the Henry Ford and Mackinac Parks um, and also small museums and um, just got off a two-year consultation uh, contract with a, a museum in Livingston County, a little community museum there, where I basically did a little bit of everything. Uh, so that's where I come from. Um, and I'm I'm speaking to you from Ann Arbor. Uh, my interest in this particular subject comes from one of my museum uh, em employment <laughs> experiences. Uh, I uh, trying to think of what year it was. I started as the assistant director of the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. And one of the jobs that I had there was to create exhibits. Uh, obviously something that that reflected Michigan women and their achievements and we've changed these a couple of times a year and I was looking for some new topic uh, that we hadn't already uh, discussed and I read an article on a female lighthouse keeper who served in the Upper Peninsula and the article was about her suspicious death at her lighthouse but what really caught my eye was that in her article, she had a table of 50 other women who had served as lighthouse keepers, primary or assistant. And that just shocked me because I had no idea there were that many women who had done that in Michigan. So the exhibit was very well received. I think it's still out there touring. Um, and then I thought I have enough material here to write a book. So. I did and got the University of Michigan Press to publish it. Um, and still, even though this book was published in 2010, I'm still getting calls about it and still doing presentations. Um, and this month, March, is typically my, my busiest, although I certainly feel we can celebrate women's history every month of the year. Um, so that, that brings us up to uh, how I got to do uh, an exhibit and later a book and now a presentation on this subject of Michigan's female lighthouse keepers. Uh, just to give you a little background, although I'm sure uh, many of you have, have great knowledge of, of lighthouse history, um, the very first lighthouse keeper in the US was in on Little Brewster Island in Boston Harbor uh, in 1716. Prior to that, uh, lighthouses were non-existent the way those uh, difficult passages were marked on, on shorelines and on cliffs was to burn, just basically have a bonfire. So it was a definite advancement when the government, federal government, decided to get involved and establish this very first lighthouse in 1716. The first female keeper in, uh, in the United States was Hannah Thomas, and she also served in Massachusetts. Um, and she came on board in 1775 um, to replace her husband who had gone off to fight in the Revolutionary War. And the first female on the Great Lakes, and when I say this, I mean the American side, I don't, I don't have much knowledge of the Canadian side, was Rachel Walcott. Um, and she first started to serve in 1832. She was at Marblehead, Ohio. Um, if you know those Ohio license plates with the small uh, beacon on them, that is Marblehead. And uh, she came into her job because her husband died of cholera. And so she, you know, being there working side by side with him um, was allowed to take the reins of that particular lighthouse um, until she married and then her husband took over. And the very first female in Michigan uh, is named Catherine Shook. And she served starting in 1849 at Point O'Bark Lighthouse at the tip of the thumb. So that gives you some sense of, you know, the very first man, <laughs> the first females uh, nationally, Great Lakes wide and statewide. 
mixed. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, there were some differences in the way men and women were treated um, by the Lighthouse Service. Um, the, the method of appointment was different. For instance, um, men received appointments sometimes as a, a sort of a spoil system uh, from, from a, associating himself with a particular political party. Um, another way that men typically got in was uh, it was considered a, um, a, a position that was offered to injured men from the Civil War, which I find interesting because it's a darn hard job. So why give it to somebody who's injured? Um, whereas women came into it um, because their husband had left to, to fight in a war or their husband had died. Um, those were kind of the classic ways that women came into it. The uniform requirements were different. You've probably seen the, the men's dress uniform, the navy blue double-breasted suit and cap, matching cap. Um, the women had no requirements, um, which probably reflected the, the sense of the service that they were sort of temporary fill-in. <laughs> um, you know, it's not our it's not our grand plan to have men and women in the in the lighthouse service. So let's not spend time designing a uniform for them. Um, women were not allowed to serve at isolated lights, and that could be on land, but most likely on an island um, or on light ships. Light ships are are essentially like like it <laughs> sounds lighthouse on a ship um, that's moored over some particularly treacherous um, shoal. And those ships were staffed by four or five men. And, and I guess you can probably figure out why it wouldn't be a good idea to have one woman on that. Um, the lists of responsibilities were the same, though. Um, so there wasn't any, you know, let's give a lighter workload to the women. Um, the women were expected to do everything. The men were, uh, with one exception, which was if they're if they happened to be serving at a lighthouse that had a tower that needed to be painted, that was usually done by lowering yourself on a bosun's chair down the side of the tower from the top and thought to be rather unladylike um, given the fashions of the 19th century, primary century in which most women served. Um, and then interestingly, the salary was exactly the same. And you never got rich in the lighthouse service, but you know at least you didn't suffer any um, you know whatever any kind of um, issue between men and women uh, just because you were not a man. Next, uh, here are some just general statistics about the Michigan women who served as lighthouse keepers. Um, they their service spanned 105 years through both the Lighthouse Service and into the Coast Guard era. There were 52 known female lighthouse keepers and assistant keepers in the state, more than any other state in the Union, probably because we had more lighthouses than any other state in the Union. And they served at 42 different lighthouses on Lake Huron, Michigan Superior, and in the Detroit River. Um, the, not in Lake Erie, so I'll just, just make that note. And the, they served an average of 5.5 years, um, which is actually longer than the average that men served. Men had many more uh, employment opportunities. So I'm sure that's why they maybe spent a couple of years and moved on, but the women generally really needed the job that they had, so they served longer. And nine uh, of our Michigan women served 10 years or more. Mo as I mentioned, um, most succeeded a deceased husband or filled in for an absent one. And several families or females were part of keeper families with mothers, fathers, siblings, and children involved. Um, on Lake Michigan, that would, a typical family in that case would have been the Sheridans. Uh, on Lake Superior, the Corrigans. On Lake Huron, the um, Garrity's. Our first lady of the light served so early, we don't have a photo of her, unfortunately. Her name was Catherine Shook, and those dates are 
her in, in case of all the women to follow birth and death dates. Uh, Catherine served at Point Park, took over in 1849. She and her husband had just moved there for him to take on this uh, assignment. And he had gone to, to down to Port Huron um, in a boat with some other people and he drowned. So uh, suddenly she was left to raise eight children alone in the wilderness of the Thumb. And that was a wilderness at that time. That wasn't a well-settled area by any means. Um, and shortly after they uh, that tragedy occurred, they were burned out of their cottage, uh, the keeper's cottage. Um, and it was discovered that there was a problem with how their chimney had been constructed. So it was no one's fault at the lighthouse, but it was obviously a devastating loss. And they just threw together what they could, a little lean-to, and stayed there until you know a lighthouse tender showed up. Um, with materials to to rebuild that. Um, and interestingly, um, Catherine couldn't sh uh, couldn't sign for those materials because she was a female. So her oldest son did that for her. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, she served for just two years before um, resigning and moving on. Um, but the it's interesting that she was the very first female because she's the one that as I've encountered when I've spoken about the subject, this subject, she's the one has the most descendants, it seems, um, or people who approach me, have approached me at, at uh, some of my presentations and saying, you know, she was a great, great, whatever, aunt, great, great grandmother. Um, and some of you probably know that one of her descendants owns Port Sanilac Light and is the head of the Michigan Lighthouse Alliance, I think it is, Conservancy. Uh, Jeff Shook. So the Shooks uh, have continued to have um, uh, a lot of influence in lighthouses in Michigan. This is a picture of Anna Garrity. So she's one of these people who came from a lighthouse family. Um, she served with her, her family for a combined 184 years at Presque Isle Lights. Uh, and they, the, her mother did too. She assisted the father, Patrick. And then um, I want to say three brothers also went on to become keepers. So they loved where they were up there in uh, Presque Isle, which is near Alpena, um, and just you know really um, put their name on that area. That is for sure. Um, she, Anna, is the only female lighthouse keeper who has a statue, and it is up at Presque Isle. Um, and she was the second longest serving woman in Michigan, 20, 23 years. <laughs> Sometimes when I show this picture, there's sort of a gasp <laughs> at how drawn out poor Julia Braun looks. Um, and this was obviously a picture from her older years. Uh, this is sort of the after picture of women who served as lighthouse keepers. It was, you know, it was hard work. It was hard work for men. It was hard work for women. And you just didn't have any fat on you at the end of your, your career. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I think of when I see this. Julia served uh, in my hometown of Bay City on the Saginaw River Lights. And she was married to a, one of these Civil War uh, men who had become injured in that war. Um, and after he died, while they were there, she succeeded him. And that was a, a formal appointment. Um, she was she was tasked with overseeing the construction of the existing lighthouse there. And she served as a keeper until her next marriage to a man named George Way. Um, immediately, <laughs> she was demoted down to assistant keeper. And then several years later, her position was abolished altogether. Um, and then six months later was reestablished with a man. <laughs> there are a number of women, as I've looked at records from uh, women in particularly in Michigan, but also extending into Wisconsin, um, a number of women who whose positions were abolished in 1882. That must have been some sort of you know, policy change there where they were actively trying to weed out the women and, um, you know, just 
for whatever reason in 1882. I call her the persevering lady because she had to, she, she had she hung in there and got demoted steadily, but she was um, she did a great job. No, no scandals associated with Julia. And I bet you all recognize this person. Um, I, I sometimes refer to her as the rock star of Michigan female lighthouse keepers because she's the one, if you know any, she's the one you probably know or have heard of. Um, she served 41 years between, obviously between her original um, post at Beaver Island Harbor and where you are at Little Traverse. Um, 41 years, that's longest in, in Michigan. She wasn't the longest in the Great Lakes. That honor belongs to Harriet Colfax down in Michigan Cindy, City, Indiana. And she served for two more years, so 43. And then in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, there was a woman who served for 51 years, which is pretty astounding. Um, but Elizabeth is, is famous for a number of reasons. She succeeded a, a deceased husband who died trying to save people um, on a shipwreck in, in uh, off Beaver Island. And she stayed there for 12 years. Um, then she remarried and requested a transfer and served there for another 29 years. Um, she wrote an autobiography, which is part of the reason for her, um, her fame. Um, I always recommend this to people that they that they read it. It's it really she speaks very little of her lighthouse career. Um, she's it 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 really is a, a overarching story of her life, and she talks about being born on Mackinac Island and and um, getting married and and serving on I want to say Fox Island if that makes any sense in Lake Michigan um, as a teacher and. She happened to be part of this family, the Whitney's, who were one of the families that was living on Beaver Island when Jesse James Strang, uh, a, a Mormon leader, brought a group of, of uh, his followers to the island. And that was that's a whole nother story. <laughs> and uh, her family was involved in some issues with, with him. Um, ultimately, he kicked all the... Look, he called Gentiles off the island, her family among them. So that was very uh, uh, a very interesting chapter in her book. Um, he was later killed by some of his followers, and so the Whitney's moved back. Um, so they they made it through that. But um, but anyway, the autobiography talks about you know a, a good a sweep of her life. So I, I really think it's a, a good thing to read, and she she writes very well. Um, but there's also been a wonderful children's book, which I think you have at your museum um, the gift shop. Uh, I just think it's delightful. Um, there's been a play written about her. And in the sort of accepted national book on female lighthouse keepers, she has a, a chapter in there. So that's, you know, women who kept the lights by the Clifford's mother and daughter writing duo. So that says something too if you know in a national book you're you're mentioned um so that's why i call her the rock star and i love this photograph i just think it's so so typical of the time and and uh would love to have seen a photo of her as a young woman maybe you have one of those in your museum this was the last lady of the light um Frances um, was actually an, an inlander. She grew up in Pontiac and she trained there to be um, to work in a business office. And she took a summer uh, trip to Lake Michigan. And while she was there walking the beach, she met this young man who ended up being a keeper at White River Lighthouse. And um, I think she came back and visited him a second time. And I think he came out and visited her at Pontiac. Um, eventually they got married, and so then she moved to the light to assist him, so officially as an assistant. Um, it was a rocky marriage, <laughs> uh, very, uh, very contentious, and she was, she was a very um, tenacious woman, kind of a little spitfire, and she, you know, resented the fact that he would be off hunting and fishing while she was not only 
doing some of the, I guess you might call housekeeping aspects of, of duties of a lighthouse keeper, but generally, you know, working all of it, um, uh, it was something that just she really became a, um, a divisive issue between the two of them. And so she divorced him, pretty daring for the time. And uh, she served in the 40s. Um, and they ended up both leaving the lighthouse at that point. She went back to Pontiac. She missed the lighthouse desperately. And she heard that the couple that moved in after her and her husband weren't doing a good job. So she petitioned the Coast Guard who had taken over the lighthouse service to see if she could return. And they said yes. And they allowed her to come by herself um, without an assistant. So uh, she was, uh, it, White River is a, a, an opening a channel to uh, White Lake, which is really a more of a, a vacation lake, if you will, with some fishing boats. So it was never an area of uh, heavy shipping traffic. So there were, there were, there definitely was not a life-saving station there. Um, but every so often, uh, someone who came out to Lake Michigan and wasn't aware of the tides would get caught um, in rip tides and would you know, end up yelling from, from wherever they were. And she was known for you know, coming down the tower, racing across the sand, jumping into the water and saving people. Um, she was only a, a tiny thing. I mean, like five foot, five foot two maybe. Um, but she could swim, and um, one of the sort of celebrated stories is that she swam out to help a, a woman who was panicked, so panicked, and she was a heavy set woman. And you know, Francis put her arm around her and started stroking back with the other arm, and uh, the woman just was she was dragging them down. She couldn't calm herself, so Francis socked her in the jaw. <laughs> and that stopped that. Um, and when they got to shore, that woman asked her, why, why did you do that? You know, why did you hit me? Um, and she said, well, if I hadn't done that, we definitely both would have gone down. So she, uh, uh, like I said, she was a, a feisty gal and, and was um, very well respected and loved in, in her area, um, which is south of Muskegon. There were some tragedies among the women uh, who served as female lighthouse keepers. Um, this is a picture of Julia Sheridan. She helped her husband, assist, a formal assistant, um, on South Manitou Island. And she had, um, I want to say, four boys uh, as children. And she had been out in a boat with her husband and her infant child and a friend of theirs going to the mainland. On the way back, they they drowned all but the man who owned the boat. Um, it's a terribly tragic story. Um, and the boys who were left on the island, of course, had no idea what had happened. And I can only imagine, you know, what their reaction was when they found out that they had lost their mother, father, and an infant brother. But one of those Sheridans, the, the siblings, went on to be a lighthouse keeper of his own. And then early in my talk here, I referenced Mary Terry. Uh, she served in Escanaba uh, in a little white wooden uh, lighthouse that was right at the edge of Lake Michigan. And um, she, one night, a fire broke out at her lighthouse. Um, and it burned quite a, quite a while before anyone noticed because it was out a ways from the town. By the time they got there and daybreak had come, um, you know, the, the lighthouse was just um, splintered wood and her body was found there dead. Um, an inquiry was then called into what happened. Is this a crime? Is it a fire to cover up a crime? You know, what happened exactly? Um, what was known was that Mary Terry was very frugal with her money and owned some property uh, in Escanaba. So ultimately the thought was perhaps she was robbed by someone and the fire was you know, lit to cover up that crime, um, but no person was ever named in, in her death. 
and then Anna Garrity, who served at Presque Isle Lights, um, when she was just a teenager and her father was the lighthouse keeper with her mother assisting, Anna was assaulted by a one of the assistant lighthouse keepers. And if you've ever read a lighthouse keeper's log book, you know they're very by the book, no pun intended, um, you know, just report on what you see or what happened, you know, what was the weather, did anyone important visit, did anything malfunction. Um, but the day that this occurred to Anna, her father wrote, my daughter was raped by this person. And that he was um, picked up by the sheriff. Um, I, I never could find any record of exactly how he was punished by the, at least by the local authorities, but he was, of course, fired from the U.S. Lighthouse Service. Um, but, you know, just a few years later, Anna herself was serving as a, as a keeper. Um, so she just, you know, obviously had that, that amazing drive for this kind of work, um, despite this terrible tragedy that she had personally experienced. And we had some triumphs among the ladies. Um, one of the things, at least in the Michigan Lighthouse Keepers, is the group of Michigan females. Um, again, to my knowledge, there weren't any splashy, life-saving situations. Um, there weren't any um, shipwrecks that occurred off the shore <laughs> kind of thing, you know. Um, so it was a kind of a, it was quiet among the women, let's put it that way. Um, and, but here were a few that did stand out. Uh, this is a picture of Anastasia Truckee, also known as Eliza. And she um, kept the critical Mar Marquette Harbor light lit during the Civil War. Her husband had um, signed up and actually formed a, a regiment up in Marquette very early on in the Civil War, left, obviously, to go down south to fight in that war. Um, and while he was gone, she kept the light lit and there were no issues about any, you know, ships running aground, coming in or out of the harbor. Um, but particularly, that was an important assignment because that was a place where the iron ore was coming, you know, down to the, to the shoreline to be taken away to be made into all kinds of armaments, whether it was cannonballs or, you know, rifle stocks or something, uh, barrels. Um, they, you know, this iron ore supply had to come and it had to come through there. And so she made sure that that lighthouse was always lit and that there were no, no problems with the um, freighters that came to pick it up. Obviously, Elizabeth Whitney Williams was the first keeper at a new light, which I've read was a um, an honor. You know that was a sign of someone who had served a good long time and you know had not um, not been reprimanded and had a good reputation um, among the mariners that passed through. So that was uh, a wonderful honor for her. And then two of the women uh, in Michigan were were able to manage male assistants. That was a rarity. Um, Jane Enos at St. Joseph. And again, Anna Garrity at Presque Isle. We don't know as much about what happened to the female lighthouse keepers as we'd like to. Um, uh, here are a couple that we do know something about, though. The, the woman pictured here, Caroline Litigat and Taya. Um, she served in, uh, in the Detroit River um, with her husband, initial, her first husband, Barney Litigat. Um, she is the aunt of Henry Ford, um, Barney. Her husband was his uncle, um, Henry Ford's mother's last name, or maiden name was, was Lydica. Um, he was, again, one of these Civil War men who had been damaged in the war. And when he died, Caroline took over for him um, at that particular post. Um, she managed on her own with, uh, she had two boys at that point. Um, then she got married again. Um, interestingly, her husband didn't live anywhere near her. He lived up in Port Huron, had a business up there. And she continued, even after they were married and she had a, a third child, continued at the lighthouse um, until the baby was about one year, one year old. And then she 
moved up to Port Hero with, with the rest of her family. Um, Frances Johnson, our last lady of the light, started a second career, or I should say continued her first career, which was in business. She uh, worked in many places in Muskegon in uh, office management and retired from one of those businesses after 25 years. So she, she definitely had a good solid second career. And others remarried and changed names in the process or moved away. It really is difficult to trace what happened to them. And anybody who's done genealogy, you know that challenge with women in their last names, especially women of the 19th century. Um, so that's unfortunate, but it is what it is. And it's all we have to work with. I actually had a chance to meet Frances Johnson. Um, she, when I had the exhibit up or was planning the exhibit, she was still alive and she, um, I was able to connect with her up in White River, still lived up there, Whitehall actually, and asked if I could come up and talk to her. So we, she sat down with me and, and we did an interview and, um, she actually came down to the opening of the exhibit and it was so exciting because people felt like, you know, they had this, like, immediate connection to the past as person standing there, you know, um, who did something that was his story in the, in the distant past, not so distant, but uh, she, she really lit up the room. <laughs> a very funny lady. Um, and then she died about a year after the, the exhibit. Um, it, and most people, you know, would assume that that was the excitement of her life, like the most important thing she did. Um, but if you asked her that, her self-described claim to fame was that she was on What's My Line, the TV show where the uh, celebrities would try and guess the, the occupation of someone. And um, they got pretty far, but they didn't get to what she did. They got to the fact that she was from Michigan. They thought she was from around the Battle Creek area. So they, you know, it kind of extrapolated that into maybe she worked in the cereal industry. Um, but, you know, she stumped them and she got $50 for her uh, for doing that and, you know, sort of wined and died while she was in New York City and the train ride back. <laughs> and when I talked to her, when I went to her house, you know, I expected she would have all sorts of artifacts or documents relating to her lighthouse uh, career. Instead, she pulls out a huge bulletin board <laughs> with all that she collected from this trip to New York City. I mean, her trade tickets, you know, photograph of the, the celebrities, and um, they took her to a play one night, you know, play, play tickets and all of this, and every every newspaper article that was published about her doing that. Um, so I thought that was interesting, talk about putting things in a different perspective. Um, and at the end of the, the interview um, that I conducted with her, which, by the way, is in the book, <laughs> um, I you know, after we kind of laughed about this, that, you know, she thought that that this was her biggest accomplishment was going on what's my line. I kind of pressed her a little bit more and just said, you know what, but, you know, you know, you were an important figure. You were, and certainly as the last figure in this legacy of female lighthouse keepers, um, you know, what, what do you think about that? And, you know, people talk about you because of these things. And, and she said, well, I don't know. I don't know. I hate to talk about myself. I, I just had fun. That's all I cared about. So uh, that was a um, kind of fitting ending to the story, <laughs> not only of her, but of Michigan's female lighthouse keepers. So well, that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you so much, Patricia. That was lovely. I. I definitely think I'm going to have to buy the book now. I may have been sneaking peeks while I was sitting downstairs at the front desk, um, but I know I have so many questions about the lives of these different women, um, and I can't wait to read about them. Um, there are, let's see, there are a couple of questions that people have messaged me. If you have any others, um, uh, attendees, please let me know. Uh, this one is, oh, uh, which female lighthouse keeper is your favorite and mm. why? <laughs> well, 
Well, I'm, I'm of course partial to Julia Braun because she served where where I grew up, and I thought she had kind of gotten the short end of the stick with getting steadily demoted. But um, but other than that, I don't know. I might say Mary, or excuse me, Anna Garrity, um, just because of you know the amazing start she had, <laughs> negative start um, in lighthouse keeping, but you know she persevered and and went on to serve you know second longest period in in our, our state's history. So I just thought, you know, that's amazing what she went through and still came out on top. Gotcha. Um, this one, uh, it said, you mentioned that you, the exhibit that you put together, you think it's still traveling or still, or is it still in the, the location where you first displayed it? I think this person might be interested in seeing it. Yeah, um, actually, let's see what time are the, I want to say sometime last year, I can't remember quite what time of the year it was, it was in St. Joseph, and I went there to speak about um, about my book, um, so I know it was there just last year, um, yeah, and, and the it's a little tricky, you can rent it, but um, the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame, as some people probably know, um, is, uh, it's kind of, it's sad, it's not kind of sad, it's sad. Um, it had, it was taken over by a different group and they moved it to an office building in downtown Lansing and it's in the basement of this building and to my knowledge it's it's simply the um, the panels that were part of the Hall of Fame it wasn't you know the exhibits that were done um, periodically too so um, so I honestly don't know if you can see um any that my exhibit or any other one in that building now but they are um they are definitely rentable through michigan women forward i think is the name of the organization now so yeah. well thank you that's good yeah. to know I'll, I'll tuck that away in case i need to know that um let's see uh oh a couple more questions here what advice or mentoring do you think these ladies would want to share with the young women of today? <laughs> Good question. Well, um, I didn't mention this in a slide, but many of the female lighthouse keepers had many children. <laughs> it wasn't uncommon to have seven, eight <laughs> or more. Um, so I, I think a good lesson was, you know, many hands make light work. <laughs> don't <laughs> don't refuse any help that comes your way of that kind of thing and um and also you know these women like today you know were juggling ra raising their kids and schooling their kids you know if they were at a remote lighthouse um literally it was a homeschooling situation and uh the lighthouse service helped a bit by providing a, a traveling box of books that would come periodically on the lighthouse tenders um so that you know there could be some some formal lesson lesson uh, given out to, to the kids. So, you know, there they were juggling their important job and and trying to, uh, you know, not not only, you know, get their kids dressed up and off to school, they were school. So I think that it's interesting that someone back in those days was was challenged by some of the things that we still are challenged by today. Um, but you know, the I would also say that I the only thing I can think of where one of the women in Michigan misbehaved, quote unquote, was um, after one woman's husband died and she was the sole keeper. Um, there were there she went through a period of alcoholism, and she was eventually um, asked to leave the service because of that. So, but there were many many other instances like that among men. Uh, this was the only story I read about women so um so women really again you know sort of <laughs> just in in so many ways they kind of outshone their male counterparts and and uh, tried to make it that other people you know other women could could come up behind them yeah definitely a, a lot to be learned about perseverance and about uh work-life balance uh, mm -hmm. from those types of women um let's see there's another question about do you still write anymore or do we do it would you write another book what's your I, I, interest yeah i've written three other books actually since then oh. um one of the stories in in the light ladies of the lights book which was about 
generally about lighthouse families and, and the children and, and such. Um, what in my book I included was about a young woman who um, saved a man's life in the Detroit River and the young woman, and I mean young, <laughs> like 13, um, she was the daughter of a lighthouse keeper. And so she rode out a mile to find this man and, and you know, rode back with him. And, and she actually was awarded one of the two formal uh, medals that you can receive in the United States, even to this day, for lifesaving. Um, so I just thought that was such a wonderful story. Um, so that got me thinking about, you know, so often children, um, when they're looking for a biography to read, it's usually about an adult, <laughs> but you know, what, what can we say about kids? You know, how, what stories do kids have that uh, show that they were, you know, just really strong and innovative and driven even as children. Um, so I started doing research on that topic and came up with many, many girls that I could choose from to put in this book, which ended up being a chapter book of 20 mini biographies. Um, and it was it was easy enough for the, if I'd wanted to do a book just on children and girls in the arts, like dance or you know music or theater, that would have been easy. Or, or athletics, because obviously in athletics you start very early. Um, but I wanted it to be a broad broad based book for anybody who might pick it up and think, oh look, there's somebody in here who, you know, was a whatever a horse a jockey, you know, or uh, something that you know, something that would be different or maybe something that resonated with them. So um, that book came out in 2015. And then um, it was called Great Girls in Michigan History. And then as I toured around with that, I got a lot of questions from little boys in classrooms saying, when are you going to do one on boys? So I, I did that one that came out in 2018. So same same kind of format. Um, that's Bold Boys in Michigan History. Um, and those are both published by Wayne State University Press. And then uh, on an unrelated topic, but but one that I have an interest in, um, I wrote a tour guide, uh, travel book, if you will, to the town that I live in now, which is Ann Arbor, because I've lived here for decades. And I had been up at Mackinac Island just shopping in their little island bookstore and had seen a, a book series that was titled 100 Things to Do in, fill in the city name, before you die. And one was on Mackinac Island. And um, I thought, you know, I could write one of those about Ann Arbor, I'm pretty sure. And uh, so I pitched that idea to the publisher of this series. And so now I have a, a travel guide out, 100 Things to Do Before You Die in Ann Arbor. You know? So that just came out and... Oh, yes, that came out at the beginning of the pandemic. Really bad time to, uh, you know, introduce a book about, about travel, which nobody could do. But anyway, it was fun <laughs> to, uh, to write about, fun to research, and uh, hope people feel it's useful. Do you think you'll write about any uh, women lighthouse keepers again, do a deep dive into any of their lives, especially the one you mentioned who's uh, from your hometown? Um. Probably not because uh, Diana Stanford, I see she's here too. You know, she's written about these two. There, there isn't a lot of depth of information about any of these women, with, probably with the exception of of Elizabeth Whitney Williams. Um, so yeah, Dal, it would be super challenging. I I focus on I think fifteen women in the book, and and then you know write generally about um, female lighthouse keepers. And those 15 are the ones that I had the most information on. Right. So unfortunately, I don't think I could do a deep dive um, on that. Um, but I'm always looking for book ideas. And I'm sort of semi-retired now, so I have a little more time on my hands to, to devote to a, a new book. All right. Um, I don't think I see any more any more questions questions actually i'll give people another minute to see if they want anything uh, anything else that they'd like to say um but uh before we wrap up here i will just remind everyone that uh, patricia's book 
Ladies of the Lights is available in the museum store. I put a link to our online store at the very beginning of the chat. Um, so you can uh, take a take an opportunity to really read about some of these um, lovely and inspirational women. Um, even though Women's History Month is at an end, it, like, like Patricia said, it doesn't mean we can't celebrate uh, Michigan's uh, female lighthouse keepers the rest of the year. Um, so I, I do believe uh, that we are all, uh, all finished. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, a recording of this lecture will be provided um, within the next couple of days, as soon as I can get it edited. It'll be emailed to all of you um, and to the participants who registered and couldn't join us. Uh, hopefully we'll see you at some of our next lectures. Thank you again so much for joining us and thank you, Patricia, for presenting for us. Uh, and you. hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Bye-bye. All right, have a great night, everybody.